Hey friends, welcome back to Your Enneagram Coach, the podcast. I'm Beth McCord. And if you're watching us on YouTube, which I hope you are, I hope that you'll like this video and subscribe. That would really be beneficial to us and you. Today, I am super excited about this current series because we're featuring our director of coaching, Adam Breckenridge. Now, Adam is gonna be talking with some of our certified Enneagram coaches as they describe the various thoughts and limiting beliefs that at some point, have held them back from Enneagram coaching. And we all have these limiting beliefs that plague us, right? Well, on this episode, you're gonna hear from a type eight, a type nine, and a type one on how this has impacted them. So Adam is gonna discuss with them what negative talk looks like for their personality type and what it looks like to overcome these limiting beliefs. We are so happy that you've joined this conversation. So let's jump right in. Well, hey, welcome back to the show, friends. I'm Adam Breckenridge, Director of Coaching at Your Enneagram Coach. Today, I'm standing in for Beth and Jeff McCord. And in these next few episodes, I'm going to be interviewing panels of some of our certified Enneagram coaches. And we're going to be talking about one of the most common struggles that unites all Enneagram types. Some some writers would say it's, it's the struggle. Like, the thing that keeps getting in the way of our growth and of becoming our best selves. And it happens to be a struggle that I'm very acquainted with. Um, It goes by many names. Some call it head trash. Others call it limiting beliefs or self-doubt. Many writers just call it shame, or you may know it as imposter syndrome. And, you know, just to set this up, let's let's define the term. Let's spend a couple of minutes setting this up. So, Imposter syndrome is exactly what it sounds like. It's the embodied belief and and this deeply felt experience that you're a fraud. You feel as though at any moment you're going to be exposed and found out, and it's only a matter of time before people see that you don't belong. You, You don't have what it takes. You're not enough. You're an imposter. And for me, the, the, the first time I was able to name this in my life is when I discovered the Enneagram and that I'm a type six. And I learned that sixes have this particular vulnerability to self-doubt. And once I saw that and named it, I started to notice that this was showing up all over my life. Um, my wife will, would kind of gently tease me because I'd been a pastor for over 20 years and had preached hundreds of sermons. And yet every week, I would be in sermon prep and I would say, I can't do this. I don't know what I'm doing. People don't want to hear what I have to say. I'm not any good at this. And she would say, honey, like, look at the evidence. Look at the facts of how many sermons have you preached? People keep coming back. You obviously have the job. They're paying you to do this. <laughs> but this is this is what imposter syndrome sounds like. And what I've learned as a certified Enneagram coach, I'm so excited that we're going to be talking with some of our coaches about this, because what I've learned as a coach working with clients of all types over the years is that imposter syndrome is not a six thing. It's a human thing. And therefore, it's a thing that affects all nine types. I'll give you one more piece of evidence on this. I read an article ESPN just put out a couple of weeks ago about American gymnast Suni Lee, who has become a global phenomenon after winning the the gold in the all-around competition at the Tokyo Olympics last summer. But the whole article is about her feeling like a fraud. Um, The whole article is about what she calls her imposter, this part of her that says, you didn't really deserve to win. And so I was just shocked by this. Like, here's a person who's literally the best in the world at what she does and has a gold medal to prove it. And yet there's this part of her that whispers, you're, you're really not good at this. You really don't have what it takes. You're not actually a gold medalist. And so I think the question we have to wrestle with, and certainly as coaches, we're helping our clients wrestle with, is how, how do I lead this part of myself as opposed to allowing this part to lead me and control my life? And to wrestle with that question, we're going to spend the next few weeks joined by three separate panels of some of our wonderful certified Enneagram coaches to talk about their own journey in overcoming their own limiting beliefs in order to pursue their vocational dream of becoming a certified Enneagram coach. So uh, without further ado, I'm so excited to introduce you guys. Uh, I'm joined by three amazing coaches, uh, Stevie Moultrie, Lynette Lynn, and Greg Woodard. Friends, 
thank you so much for being here and welcome to the show. I, I'd love to, to just start by having you maybe introduce yourselves a little bit, share, you know, your type, your family, where you live. And Stevie, I'm, I'm going to toss it to you first. I know you're a type <laughs> nine and you like to just jump into it. So how about just, I toss it to you? Just dive in, just give yeah. it to me, <laughs> take control. Yeah. Um, my name is Stevie and I'm a type nine. <laughs> um, so I'm from San Diego, but currently I'm up at my in-laws house um, in Northern California near Lake Tahoe. I have a husband. His name's Nick. He's a seven. He's really fun. <laughs> Hence the seven. And then I have two kids, Cruz Beckin, my son. He's five years old. Forrest Wild, my daughter. She's two and a half years old. And yeah, I love the outdoors. I love people. I love being with friends. Um, I love all all the things. I was in ministry for 10 plus years. And then just recently, my husband and I just stepped out of what we like to call traditional ministry, being like pastors at a church and ministry within like the church walls. And we just stepped out in faith and started a nonprofit called Woven Athlete, where we aim to to champion athletes' mental game before, during, and after their athletic performances and careers. And I'm going to be intertwining Enneagram work with athletes and stuff for that. So yeah, we're really excited about that. So there's a little bit about me. Oh, Stevie, thanks for sharing. That is very exciting. In fact, I'd love to follow up and talk more about that uh, yeah. offline. Yeah, um, Greg, Greg, what about you? Well, thanks for the opportunity to sit and, and have the conversation with you, Adam. I've... Uh, Still relatively new to the Enneagram world. As a coach, um, <clears throat> so I'm a one wing nine, uh, married to my lovely wife, Vicki. We've been, June will be 24 years. Uh, we have two uh, now adult children. We live in Eastern North Carolina. I live with my wife on board uh, Marine Corps Base Camp Lejeune. I'm a Navy chaplain serving Marines. That's a, a little bit about me. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to field any more questions if you want some more detail about any other part of my life. I love it, Greg. Thanks so much. Lynette, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hello, everybody. My name is Lynette, and I am an eight, but I'm actually a counter type eight, which means my motivations are the same, but I don't necessarily present Um present like the usual eight would present. So have the same motivations. Um, I have been married for 34 years, 35 come this November to an Enneagram two, which is really interesting because we share that line together. So we definitely connect um, very well. I see what attracted us to each other. Um, I'm a mom of five and a grandma of seven. And we live in Prescott, Arizona, which is in the northern part of Arizona. So more up higher elevation trees, all of that. Super beautiful. Um, I was on full-time staff as a kids pastor. Um, so definitely I'm very familiar with the, the church world. But I also worked as um, an, a mental health nurse for 20 years. And so at some of that I was doing at the same time. Um, so yeah, I love people, love getting helping people grow. And yeah, that's me. That's awesome. Lynette, thanks so much for being here. Um, My pleasure. It's, it's so great to have, have you guys with us. And I, I want to point something out as I was listening to each of you talk. I want to point this out in case our listeners uh, maybe didn't catch this. But you, what you may have noticed is that Stevie is a nine, Greg is a one. Lynette is an eight. So you all actually make up the gut triad within the centers of intelligence. You know, eights, nines, and ones are in that instinctive center, which means, among other things, you process and move into the world out of this gut intuition. You all share a common desire for justice. I know eights want to fight for the underdog. Ones want to reform what's broken. Nines want to use their voice and presence to fight for peace and for those who are overlooked. And um, but there's also this reality that, you know, because not all is right in the world and we don't always handle um, our internal world well, there's there can be this emotional imbalance that you all share that can kind of show up in a common struggle with anger. So 
it's got me curious to start. All right. We're talking about the imposter syndrome. I've already said like, hey, this is kind of something that everybody struggles with, kind of whether you know it or not. But for you guys, it is the imposter syndrome or the head trash, whatever term you want to use, is it something that shows up in the gut for you? And what I mean is, is, is it sometimes like a gut sense that's, that says like, is this gut sense of I don't have what it takes? The, is it something that sometimes manifests as anger? Uh, I'm, I'm just curious if that, if that has any, if that informs at all how this imposter syndrome shows up for you. Greg, I'd, I'd love, you know, if you want to jump in, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, you know, um, th- this has shown up, and I, I guess I didn't really understand the why until I got into the Enneagram and started understanding my type. So I know that a number of ways that it, it shows up. Uh, one is I will, I will procrastinate. Uh, so <clears throat> this is a good example. Last year, I completed a doctorate. And it took me an extra year to finish my dissertation because I kept going back to work on the edits. And I kept thinking every, all of the research and the data wasn't enough. And I had to add more and I had, and I had to get through all the process and it all had to be perfect. And finally, I realized I need to stop. I need to get this thing done or I need to just move on. So I sent it to my professor within about four days. He wrote me back and said, you're ready to defend. And I didn't at all feel ready to defend, but that's an example of me finally saying, okay, I got to hit publish and understand that there's still going to be mistakes and I can pull it off the shelf and it still has mistakes that I, I, I now wish I would have corrected as I was going through the process. But the point is that, um, so it's, for, for me, it's showing up as procrastination. I'll sit mm-hmm. and I'll edit and I'll edit and I'll edit and I'll never get it put out into the, into the real world. So that's that's one way. The, uh, another way is uh, it shows up. I, I've I've had to work at this with my family. My expectations are very high uh, for my family. You know, you might think of the, the the drivers that are also on the road with me. Their way is not perfect. My way is just do it my way. Um, and then you know that that creates. It's not as prevalent in my professional world. Um, but my the people that work for me and with me know I have high expectations. We're going to spend a lot of time after an event talking through what went well and what could have been improved. So we're always going to do after action kinds of conversations. Yes. Uh, so those are all ways that. And so, yeah, the anger is showing up into some um, internal sense that things are. not I notice everything that needs to be corrected. And, and over the years, I've learned to not always point it out because. Sometimes it's not welcome to point it out. Sure, sure. But, you know, sometimes it needs to be pointed out, so you got to find the balance. I think the growth process for me is knowing knowing when I can show up and help somebody understand a better process or a better product, but not doing it to the extent of it becoming where they just see me as a, as a critic, and that's all that I offer. Yes. Yeah. The, I mean, that's the gift of a one is you, we do, you are reformers. We, and the world desperately needs you. The imbalance is when you, when we over rely on our gifts, um, th- that creates the imbalance. And that's where we get into some of the, the, the dysfunctional patterns. And I think for uh, what I'm hearing you say is that, that that's often a place where, you know, the imposter syndrome can manifest for a type one is it can show up as an angry inner critic, not only looking at all the things around you that aren't good enough, but looking at you and saying, you know what, you're not good enough. Uh, this, this research paper is not ready to defend. You've not done well enough. You're, you're going to be exposed. They're going to bust you on this. If you walk in there, this is not good enough. Uh, I think that's a, a great example of how it can show up uh, for the type one. Lynette, what about you? Well, to be perfectly honest, I don't feel that I have struggled with the imposter syndrome so much. <laughs> Remind us again what your type is, Lynette. Um, so I am a type eight. So pretty much everything I do is fire, aim, ready. So when I, um, I felt very led by the Holy Spirit, to pursue um, Enneagram coaching, I just jumped in and um, really felt like I would be able to do it. Now, I do have to say 
that um, there are, the only time I see doubt raise its head is when um, I fear that being vulnerable because someone's going to ask me a question that I don't understand. I mean, that mm. I that I can't answer. And I don't want to look mm. vulnerable in that moment of not having the answer. But I have to tell you guys, like behind me, there are bookshelves full of Enneagram books, um, most of which I have not read um, unless mm. there was an answer I had to go after. But I think that's partly my five as well that I, you know, want to be yes. prepared um, yes. in case a question comes up. But really for me, I, I, and I do really think it is a gut thing that I feel so led by the Lord and connected to the Lord and prompted by the Lord. And I feel like anything that, that he leads me to, he's going to equip me to do. So I just don't, yes. I don't allow for a lot of that, that chatter. Sorry. Yeah, you know, as a type <laughs> six, I totally resonate with that. No, um, to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, there's just, uh, just I, no room you know, for chatter as a six. <laughs> no room for inner chatter. You know, self doubt. I, I, I'm, yeah. I renege everything that I said in, in my introduction about my battles with self doubt. Uh, me too. Me too, Lynette. Um, yeah. No, but I, I do appreciate even your vulnerability now to be honest about how it's one of the things that we all love about eights. And it's the reason why we can become codependent and put too much pressure on eights because mm. you are strong. You're very strong and you're very capable and very competent. But I appreciate you being honest that, you know, there is this part of you. And, and this is what I've discovered in working with eight clients is sometimes self-doubt can show up in. And, and maybe maybe doubt is not even the right word for it, but the imposter has an accusatory tone. Some people just call it shame. Mm. Uh, a lot of people can just call it sh you know toxic shame, but it can show up in this whisper for the type eight of some part of you saying you're weak. Don't let them see your weakness. Um, exactly. And does that resonate with 100%, you, Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I never yeah. want to appear weak in that. And knowledge Absolutely. is protects against that. It does. Yeah, it does. Absolutely. Thank you so much for even exercising that vulnerability with us and sharing that. That's huge. All right, Stevie, you're up. Hi, Matt. That's so good. I that's so funny to me, Lynette. I that's that's the exact reason why I say if I could have chosen my number, it would have been like a seven or an eight because of the assertiveness and the lack of self doubt. <laughs> I just love it so much. <laughs> um, I would definitely say that I am not short of head trash and <laughs> imposter syndrome. Um, I could probably just also turn around and be like, here's my bookcase full of imposter syndrome right behind me. <laughs> like, <laughs> and, and I have a very strong, very strong one wing. So the inner critic is, is really strong. And then if I feel stressed and I'm, have the one wing mixed with the line to my six. So it's a really fun show mm. inside inside my head when I'm, I'm not feeling like I'm in a very good place. So, I mean, if we're going to speak like directly as like the gut, how it comes up, because imposter, like I said, imposter syndrome does rear its head in the inner critic for me a lot of like, mm. you don't have what it takes. Mm -hmm. Um, you don't actually have anything good to offer or you're manipulating people into paying something that you actually can't give mm. like the, the money where that's like a big one for me. I've never been able to be in sales because I hate feeling like I'm manipulating someone into buying something they don't actually need. And so that's been one I've had to really um, like battle is, is that people are spending money because I do have something to offer them. Otherwise they wouldn't. And so that's been, that's been something I've had to work on. But when it comes to the gut, I I feel like for me, as far as specifically the gut, it's got to be um, this, like if I, and in as a nine with the gut, it's got to be this, if I um, assert myself in this world, then I'm am I going to have to continue to insert myself in the world? And do I have the energy to do that? Like, am mm. I going to have the energy to show up every day to this capacity? Because I don't feel like I do. Um, yes. And so for me, yeah. it then makes me want to like turn inward, do the procrastination, fall asleep to it, 
or like literally fall asleep and take a nap. I've never been connected to the nap of a nine. That was like, I'm a social nine too. So I'm a counter type Lynette. Also. Oh, okay. Uh-huh. Um, and so I, that was like one of my biggest pet peeves about nines was everyone said they always wanted naps and I hated that. And then I realized that I do always want naps. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, so I either like oh, just came to terms with it or I merged into oh. the idea of naps <laughs> or I just am a mom of little kids that could be it too yeah but uh, <laughs> that could be a big part um so I'd say maybe as like a gut that's probably how it shows up for me yeah Thanks for sharing that, Stevie. I think we all should uh, embrace the spiritual discipline of naps, by the way. I I love it. My wife's a type nine and every day about 1.30, 1.40 p.m., she's just like powers down. Like just to, everything shuts down. It's like I've got to take a 15, 20 minute nap. And I actually am envious of it. I'm like, man, I, I wish I could. I take a nap. I wake up and feel worse. Mm-hmm. Um. Stevie, here's what I want to do. I, I want to I want to transition to the the next the next piece of curiosity that I have, and you actually took us there because you you're you're talking about how this shows up in your coaching practice, mm-hmm. and I, I know that all, we could we could sit here and talk about what motivated you to become an Enneagram coach, but I, I think I can sum it up for you is that you you know you want you want to see you want to help transform people's lives. I mean, you guys have all taken you know, the, you've, you've all discovered the Enneagram. It's been an impactful tool in your life. Mm-hmm. You want to use it in the lives of others. And that's why you became certified Enneagram coaches. And I think we all know that the journey to becoming an Enneagram coach has its challenges. I mean, anything worth doing is going to be hard. It's going to take practice. It's going to take discipline. It's going to take sacrifice. It's going to take effort. And it, it, becoming an Enneagram coach is a place where this head trash and the imposter syndrome can really get activated. And in my experience, it's the number one hurdle people have to overcome to pursue their dream and their calling, whether that is becoming an Enneagram coach or, you know, going back to school, starting your own business in some other, you know, in, in some other field. Like it, it's, it's the number one thing that people are going to have to overcome to pursue their, their, their dreams. And for you guys in, this is where I'm curious in launching and leading your own coaching business. Can you describe what it's been like for you to push through your own limiting beliefs? What, what has it been like for you to push through that? What does that head trash sound like for you? And is it still a struggle in your coaching business? So, um, you know, Stevie, what, 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 let's let's just go back to you first again. I, 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 what, what do you what are you what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so my coaching practice for me has been slow. <laughs> it's like it's just been it's that battle with the sloth that came out really heavily, which has been kind of good in a way because it's shined light on what triggers the sloth of a nine. Um, and has given me and afforded me the opportunity to combat it and to face it head on. Um, so it, it started slow and, um, yeah, it's once I started to, um, recognize it, I would want to sit and I would want, it, it goes back to what I was talking about before. It was one with mixed with the inner critic of the sound of the um, head trash or the imposter syndrome of you don't have what it takes. You don't actually know that much um, people. You don't have anything to give to people. Um, and then for me, it was like the conflict um, that would arise potentially. It wasn't even real conflict that actually ever presented itself, but it was the potential of conflict of Mm -hmm. like when it comes, cause I come from a ministry world. So once I started hearing that, Oh, not everyone agrees with the Enneagram. Um, the idea of that could be a potential conflict that I face Mm -hmm. kind of had me stopped in my tracks a little bit. Um, I'm a social nine. And so I don't look like your typical nine. I, a lot of, there's a lot of attributes of the nine that I don't connect with, but it all comes back to the core motivations that deeply um, do connect with me. And so just even the battle of like, 
well, I don't look like your stereotypical nine. What if I'm not, what if I don't actually know myself? Mm, How can I teach yeah. someone else if I don't, if I'm doubting, am I actually a nine? So it's, it, it was a conversation in all those areas that I had to face. I had to talk with people about. I'm a verbal processor. So I had to have my safe people that I can like verbally process that through. Um, and I do still, I do still, um, experience it. I think it's, um, something that will, for my personality, I'm not saying all nines, but for me specifically, I do think it's something that I'll probably experience. It'll probably come in ebb and flow or it'll probably come in waves and ebb and flow. I don't think it's something necessarily that everybody is going to experience all the time. There's no hope. You'll you'll never get over it. But I think when I came to a place where I was like, this is a struggle I'm going to have to face. And if I sit and wait for it to be gone before I move forward, I will never move forward. So Mm -hmm. I have to learn how to work with it and how to talk unapologetically kind to myself when I experience that. And that I think is like the number one thing that helps to move forward. And being okay with just taking small steps. Because for me, I'll see, I, I don't know if it's my personality. I don't know if it's my line to the three. But I'll see other people, what they're doing. I'll see what could be. And and I think like that's what it should be for me. Um, and, and I wasn't okay with the process that takes to get there. Um, like, I didn't realize that that doesn't just happen. Like maybe for some people it happens right away. Um, but for a lot of people, there's a lot of the behind the scenes process that they don't show. Um, and you have to be okay with that. And so Mm -hmm. it came to the point where I was like, if I take one step and then take a nap, like that is okay. That is okay. But I have to be okay with taking the one step, doing the one thing saying, okay, you're numbing out right now. You're doing, you're procrastinating. You're doing all the things that actually aren't important because Mm -hmm. you're afraid to do what is, because when you do what is, that's what is going to be asserting yourself. And that's scary to you. And so let's put this down and let's do, even if it's just the one thing, I had to be okay with doing just the one thing because my mind and my mind felt like I should be doing so many things, all the things all at once. And that was too overwhelming for me. And it just caused me like analysis paralysis or not analysis paralysis. It just caused caused me uh, to stop doing anything. And so I had to be okay with doing the one thing to move forward um, and and be okay with that. Oh, Steve, that is so, yes, Lynette, that is is so, so good and so helpful. I I mean, uh, what's, what's the next right step? Uh, we're talking about how to move, how to move beyond the self doubt, how to move, not, not, and, and actually, let me rephrase that. It's not, it's not even necessarily moving beyond it's moving through. Um, because I've discovered in my own life, this may be a part of me that I never get over. It may be a part of me that I have to learn, as you said, Stevie, to live with. And so what's the next right step for me to move through this? I also heard you mention community. So in my Enneagram six brain, I went, oh, you need safe people in your life Mm -hmm. that you can open up with and you can talk about this struggle with. And they're not going to tell you you're crazy. They're not going to shame you. They're going to it's like it's like my wife, no matter how many times I come to her and say, I don't know how to preach a sermon. I don't know what I'm doing. And she provides that safe context for me to bring that fear and then offer this gentle reassurance. So that's huge, Stevie. That's so, so helpful. And then what you said about treating this, this part of you with kindness, there's uh, so much that I want to say on that, but uh, Greg, I'm, I'm curious with you, um, you know, as, as you've, you're still kind of, as you mentioned earlier on the front end of building your coaching business and you're doing some great work. um, But I know you have some great opportunities lined up as well, but how, what's it been like for you to kind of push through some of the limiting beliefs and, and what's that sounded like in your, in your, in your heart? And how are you, how are you walking through that? Um, yeah, there's a lot of ways I could just, I could explain that or respond to that. I think for me, one of the things that this is not the first time that I've thought about 
building my own whatever it is. <clears throat> but for me, I made a decision um, in the late fall through the first of the year time frame where I usually go maybe a lot of like a lot of people go through a season of reflection, kind of reflecting on the past year, looking forward to the next year and deciding what I wanted to do. And one of the things I decided I was going to do is I was going to retire from active duty. So that opened up my mind to then I had to decide, okay, then what do I want to do next? And what I don't want to do next, I'm just going to be really selfish here. I don't want to work for anybody. I want to work for myself and be flexible. Yeah. And now, since then, we've become aware and we've been watching it develop that, you know, my daughter's going to be getting married in the next little while. And at some point, whenever the, t the time comes, we'll be grandparents. And I, I don't want to be beholden. In this life that I'm in now as a Navy chaplain, I have to, I'm beholden to somebody else where I'm going to move to next. I'm going to deploy wherever I'm going to deploy to. And I guess, so th that was a big impetus behind. So now to, to your question. So I had, I've had to wrestle with, I, and as I've been in, mil in the military for almost 20 years, I simply do not have a business mind. I don't know thing one about how to do much of anything. And that was a very limiting belief because if I don't know enough, then I'm just not going to start it. And so, yeah. <clears throat> and I mentioned my degree earlier, and I think that process of 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 being acknowledged as having of having done the work and having it been accepted helped me to understand that I just needed to do. A big project like a dissertation, you have to take it into small chunks. And you have to do just the next right thing. Otherwise, it gets overwhelming. And so for me, I just started. I I I also don't like to. I don't like people to know that I, that I don't know what I'm doing. But I had to be really honest with some with some uh, with some coaches and say, you know, I don't know anything. I need you to help me understand. And that and that and those services are not free. So I had to make some financial investment. I had to be vulnerable and open and say, yeah, I simply don't know whatever it is. But I also know that I can learn things and I have learned mm -hmm. things. I've learned all, lots of different processes and, and all lots of different pieces that have to be put into place. And, and I have gotten to the point where I have a pretty good infrastructure in place. Mm. But it isn't because I really knew what I was doing. It was because I just did the, the work of investing time into understanding yeah. it and, and invested time into listening to others who, who have gone before me. Yeah. Um, so I guess the big thing is I had to, I had to be willing to push through and then I had to, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, whatever the opportunity is, I, there's, there, you know, we don't do these things for free. Um, and being, so getting over the I don't know enough and understanding that my experience and some of my credentials are valuable and are worth somebody paying yes. me to do whatever the opportunity is. So that's been yeah. and then being willing and able to name the price and then be OK with it and not feel the uh, the uncertainty of whether that was the right thing or the wrong thing. So, yeah, I love that, Greg. I You know, there's. Uh, I hear so much courage in that, you know, the, we have to, we have to be courageous. Uh, first of all, you can't be courageous if you're not afraid. Mm -hmm. So the imposter syndrome is, uh, is, is a lot of it is rooted in fear. A lot of it is, Hey, don't let them find out they're going to find out. And it's, it's trying to, you know, that part of you is trying to protect you and keep you playing it safe. And I love that you said, you know, how have I pushed through it? Well, I've, I've had to decide like, if I want to, if I want to pursue this this dream of mine, I'm going to have to be courageous, and I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to just take steps. Um, and I also love that you you allowed yourself to be curious. You know, that's another that's another uh, great strategy for shepherding the inner imposter and working through these limiting beliefs is allow yourself to be curious. You know, sometimes your your self doubt will tell you, hey, you don't know enough, or you don't you don't know what you're doing, and Sometimes you just have to agree with it. <laughs> you know what? You're right. So let me ask some questions. Um, 
And uh, you named the two biggest things, at least for when it, when it comes to becoming an Enneagram coach, two biggest hurdles uh, that people have is, you know, I'm not an entrepreneur, so I don't have the business mindset. And then the other one, Stevie mentioned as well, is why would anybody pay me for this, you know? And, um, and, and, and I, I love that, you know, you're, you're able to be curious and be compassionate with yourself and move forward with honestly believing in yourself. And I, I can't remember who said it, that money is a certificate of appreciation for the good that you do for the world that you bring to the world. Mm -hmm. So to see the value in this, the, the, the value that the Enneagram has had in your own life, uh, you can trust the value that it'll have in others' lives and the value that you bring. Um, so I love the way that you've been able to move through that, Greg. That's that's beautiful. Um, Lynette, what about you? You know, Adam, I feel like in order to answer that question, I have to take a few steps back. And just to share a tiny bit of my journey, and I feel myself getting choked up even thinking about it. But when I learned about my type as an Enneagram 8, it literally wrecked my world. Um, mm. And I say that in the sense of, I felt like there was blinders being removed. You know, I had hit so many walls in my life, especially working in the ministry world. As a female, there was a lot of walls I was hitting. Um, but I didn't understand the why behind it. So when I understood that I was an Enneagram 8, that I understood um, the why behind, you know, my distrust and, and all of those things, things that I found myself having to make apologies for, for a lot of the years of my life, but also now other people could understand me better in all yes. of that, when I say wrecked, I mean wrecked to the point that I, my best friend who is an Enneagram six, I remember going to her and just saying, I feel like I need to get into counseling because it, this is stirring up so much and so many ahas as to um, my childhood, you know, trauma stuff, all the stuff that came together in that. And so I started looking for a counselor, literally just to process all I was learning about my Enneagram type. And I could not find one that knew anything about the Enneagram and I real and the gospel. Like it was important to me to have both of those pieces. So as I started looking and I didn't want to pay big bucks for a counselor that didn't understand the Enneagram that could help walk me through that, God led me to Beth and your Enneagram coach. And I read that and I'm like, yes, this is it. This is what I need. But this is also yeah. what other people need is to understand their type, to walk in freedom. And, and that was the word God kept giving me is people need to be coached about their type so they can walk in freedom. Okay. Yes. And so with that, at that point, Adam, I was like, I don't care what it takes. I have to do this. I have to become a coach. So this is at the point that now I'm feeling like God is calling me out of ministry as a kid's pastor and into Enneagram coaching. And I was at a place like, uh, but I'm not going to have insurance. How am I going to get money? You know, like all of that. But God, you told me. And so I will. And so I was yeah. very, my thought was, I want to work with people who have been on church staffs that need to un that need the insight of someone who understands the ministry world, but also the enneagram and the gospel and all of that. Well, mm -hmm. I started to move through that. You know, the, there is a cost to become an enneagram coach. You know, financially, yeah. um, there is time that is dedicated to studying and becoming good at what you do. There is practicing, you know, all of those things. But Adam, I have to tell you, for me, it was, I don't care. <laughs> like, I want people to have this. Mm. Like, I want people to have this. I want people to walk in freedom. And I will do whatever it has to take. So, so I want to backstep a minute, because to say that there was never, ever doubt, you know, whenever I would get a, a session scheduled, I would text my best friend again, who is a six and my, you know, she would always say to me, Lynette, you know, that God called you to do this. 
<clears throat> excuse me, and that he is going to give you whatever you need with this person. And that was all I need. I'm like, truth. You're right. I needed that truth. Thank you. I'll keep moving forward. So the reality is the clientele I thought I was going to have, I've had a couple of, <clears throat> but then God, you know, just brings different people to me that are not in that world. And I honestly believe every single time that it was the Holy Spirit that brought that client to me in that moment for a particular reason. And to me, I would do whatever, I would do this for free. I'm sure you guys feel that too, right? Like you love it so much, you would do it for free. But like Greg said, we have to earn money too. <laughs> like we have to pay the bills, we have to, whatever that is. But so I say all that to say that the passion behind equipping people to know their type, to expose the lies that they believed forever, mm -hmm. and then to layer it with the truth of the gospel, because it's the gospel that sets us free from those lies that have kept us in bondage. So that's what pushes me through when, you know, maybe I don't feel like I have enough clients or whatever it is. It's just like, God, you brought this person to me and I trust you're going to equip me. So, yeah. Oh, Lynette, thank you so much for, <laughs> for sharing that and, and, and just sharing your heart with us. And I think you put the exclamation mark on how do you push through this? I mean, it, it could be becoming an Enneagram coach. It could be doing anything that you want to do, anything that's, that's a risk that is, uh, I can't remember who said once it's it's scarier to share your dreams than your failures. Mm, that's good. And any any dream that you have that you want to pursue, you're gonna you're gonna bump up against this imposter syndrome. And, and what I love about what you just shared, Lynette, is you know when when from Stevie and Greg talking, we talked about okay, well if you're gonna move through this, you're gonna need safe people to process with you. You're gonna need to have the courage to always just take the right next step. You're going to need to treat this part of you with kindness, right? Because kindness leads to change and repentance. Um, and what I'm hearing you say, Lynette, is you have to keep the why in front of you. Yeah, exactly. The purpose for why you got into this. Mm -hmm. And and you're, it's, it's connected to your story. It's what God has done in your life through this tool and your the vision that you have for wanting to serve other people, even that niche group of serving like ministry leaders is, you know, as a guy that's been a pastor for 20 years, I'm just over here saying like, yes, and amen. That's there's a huge need for that. Mm -hmm. But it's how do you move through the imposter syndrome? It's keeping it's keeping the why in front of you, knowing your why, keeping it in front of you. And uh, Lynette, thank you so much for sharing that passion with us. Mm -hmm. My pleasure. So, very contagious. Now, I think um, I just had a couple more questions I wanted to ask you guys. There's this Brene Brown, you know, I love Brene Brown, has made this quote from Joseph Campbell famous where J Campbell says, um, the cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you seek. And it gets at what I just said about pursuing your dreams. The images that Campbell's painting is you're, you're standing at the edge of a cave. And you don't know what's on the other side of it. You don't know what's five steps into it. You don't know where this thing is going to go, but you know there's something inside the cave that you want. There's treasure in there. But to get the treasure, you have to walk through the fear. You have to walk through the doubts. You have to walk through the uncertainty. You have to walk through the I don't have control. Um, and so for you guys, I'm curious, what is the treasure you've discovered? in pursuing your dream of becoming an Enneagram coach. As you've walked through your fears, as you've walked through the uncertainty, what's the treasure in the cave that has made it worth it, you know, all worth it for you? Um, Greg, do you have, do you have uh, thoughts on that? Yeah, I do. Um, <clears throat> so a lot of my previous work has been, I spent 14 years now as a Navy chaplain working with people that are in large part that come to see me are in some of the most challenging places of their lives. And I've done that in where I'm at now, which is in North Carolina. And I've also done that on board a naval vessel in the Middle East. And I've done that on the ground in, 
in the Pacific region. So I've done it in a lot of different ways. And then I've also thought a lot about how our work, uh, how our how our soul care and how our emotional health, how they're connected. And mm-hmm. what does one mean to the other? And, and so part of the part of the considering the consideration of emotional health is to understand is to is to I walked a journey of understanding something about the true self and the false self. And there's really both of us in our lives. And the Enneagram, as I've been discovering, really speaks to those false messages. Mm-hmm. And it opens up the opportunity for us to address those false messages so that we can live fully into their into our true self. And when we're living into our true self, then we are moving towards being emotionally healthy. Because if we don't live into our true self, we aren't, we're going, there's going to be, uh, we might tend towards burnout. We might tend towards uh, ministry frustration. Um, and so I've worked at, uh, my my dream and desire is to help people discover their true self and God's purpose for their lives through guided conversations leading toward clarity, confidence, and congruence between the vocational choice and who God made them to be. And so I've I've that's been my dream to do that to help people to understand the the trueness of who they are and then to step boldly into working that out in their lives. Yeah, I love it. Well, yeah, it absolutely is because you're you're saying your treasure is here's my the treasure. It's helping people. It's chasing that that contagious moment whenever you see people the light bulb yeah. click for your clients and you see the transformation happen. That's always been my favorite part of being a coach is you have a front row seat to watching God change people's lives, and when you see people becoming their best self, discovering their true self of who they really are in Christ. Right. You're saying for you, that has been the treasure that makes it, you know, all worth it. And so that's what you're, that's what you keep. Am I, am I, am I, am I, am I hearing that right, Greg? Yeah. Yeah. That really yeah. is it. And in my chaplain work, it's me. It, a lot of times it's me telling, like they're coming to me. I tend to work with a very young crowd. So they're coming and they're seeking guidance. They're wanting somebody to tell them. Yeah. And coaching is not like that. Coaching is listening, stepping back and helping, mm-hmm. helping the client to discover the truths of who they are. And we're yes. there in that guiding process along the way, asking clarifying questions, helping them to move towards their own deep understanding of who they are as people and how that can then, in my, as I think about how that can then best play out in, in their vocational choices. I'm at the point in my life where I have had a lot of experience in my vocation and I've and I've also spent a lot of time reflecting on what it means to live in congruence with who I am and what I do. And, and so it's it's a, it's a gift for me to be able to walk with people as they seek some clarity and, and some confidence in who they are as people and how they can connect that into their it might mean a big change in their lives. It might yeah. not. Maybe maybe they'll stay with what they're yeah. doing, but maybe it means that they need to make significant change uh, in vocation or in in location or in a number of other areas of their life. Yeah. Yeah. Love that, Greg. That, that does make it worth uh, pushing through whatever you have to push through to seeing that change happen. Lynette, uh, what about you? Well, I think you touched on it, Adam, but it is when people get it, you know, I seen, I love when the, the lies are exposed that they've believed all their life and then giving them like the tangible tools to, you know, work on something because I'll give them an assignment and then they'll work on it for a couple of weeks. And then we come back together and they're like, I tried this and it worked. And, you know, seeing relationships change because now they're, they're believing truth instead of the lies that trigger them so often. But I think that that to me is the biggest when they're just like, yes, you know, they have been armed with something they feel can actually bring tangible change um, rather than just, you know, revisiting a thing over and over and over. You know, last week I got to work with this. um, It was a student team in Florida and there was a group of 10 people and I went through all their nine, you know, the nine types and, and I would pause after going through each one and ask each 
whoever was that type to explain, you know, what, what would you like to add to that? And as they would do that, I would see people like throwing their hands up in the air going, that's why you do that. Or yes, that's me, you know, and even seeing like all of a sudden now they're like connected in similar things, but then have insights into, oh, that's why you behave like that when we come to a meeting or there's conflict or whatever. So to me, I I walk out of those things just like on top of, you know, the world because yeah. now they they have a tool that they can yeah. do that we know it's not going to just change their work, you know, life. It's going to change every relationship, you know. So yes. that's it for yeah. me. That's the treasure. That's that's the treasure. Absolutely, that's the treasure. that's the treasure. Yeah, yeah, yes. Love it, Stevie. Yeah, Lynette. Actually, I love what you both were saying. I feel like I can connect both connect to both of those so much. As in, like when you f- see someone get it, like you're saying, Lynette. I know for me, I being in ministry for the last ten plus years, I did a lot of teaching. And seeing, watching people experience um, the love of God in a way that they haven't before is just thrilling. Um, and then to, to match that with the, the exposure of the Enneagram into the parts of you that you may not have been able to put words to. Um, but I would say also what you were saying, Greg, about the, the true self, for me, the treasure is, is the thrill of living awake. And I, that sounds like, ooh, that, what does that even mean? But I think it was Beatrice Chestnut that said, uh, she wrote, um, most people who live in the subconscious or the false narratives live in this kind of waking sleep. And I read that and I was like, wow, that, that just hit home for me. And I remember listening to Sleeping at Last Enneagram song um, on the Enneagram nine. And I remember when I heard, um, the, the words to that song, the lyrics to that song, I've been sleepwalking since I was 14. Yeah. And I realize now that I've been half myself for more than half my life. I get choked up right now thinking about it. I remember hearing those words and just weeping on my bedroom floor Yeah, because it just showed, it, it shined so much light on something that I didn't I never was able to put words to, um, and that the treasure of of living awake. It's uh, it's funny that you mentioned Brene Brown because I love she quotes um, Teddy Roosevelt, President Teddy Roosevelt, and his daring yeah. greatly quote. Yes. Um, and it's too long for me to quote right now, but if if people are unfamiliar with it, it's essentially saying. That it's not the person who stands, who sits in the stands, the critic who sits in the stands that has weight to his words, but the person who's in the arena that really counts. And, and that's what I want. Like, I want to be living fully awake. I want to be in the arena. I don't want to sit in the stands and wish I dared greatly. Mm-hmm. I want to actually dare greatly. I want to be in the stands. I want to be bruised and dirty and and cut up from passion and skepticism mixed together. Like I want to experience life fully awake. I don't want to be, I don't want to walk through in a a sleeping, I don't want to sleepwalk anymore. And that's what Enneagram's really been helping me to do is be like, you're sleepwalking, wake up. And if I could help that for other people too, like I have a new client that I'll be meeting with and she's a nine and a new mom. And I was like, whatever I can do, for you to to make this affordable and available like i know how powerful it is as a nine and a, as a nine in general but then as a mom like a new mom they say that nines are like if you get the ball rolling they can be unstoppable mm-hmm. but if the if the ball stops they can almost be immovable again mm-hmm. and that was one of the most difficult things in my life is leaving a high level job um, or a high level volunteer position at the same time as becoming a new mom, my whole world stopped. Mm. And then I had to transition into just figuring out what it was to be a new mom. And that was one of the hardest moments of my life as, as a nine specifically. So if I could help, especially other moms experience like what it means to get the ball going again and to live 
awake, that's where the treasure is. And that's, yeah. I want to live awake. I want to live bruised and passionate and just consumed with the the thrill of living awake. So for me, that's, that's the treasure. That's so good. Yeah. Wow. So good. What beautiful, yeah. beautiful treasure you mm-hmm. described, Stevie, that makes mm-hmm. it worth all of the self-doubt uh, pushing through that uh, to mm-hmm. pursue that treasure. So beautiful. Um, and there's so much I want to say about that. Gosh, I'm over here saying like, man, I want to talk about waking up. <laughs> I want to talk about, you know, being so my mind, my, the, the neurons in my brain are firing with all the Bible verses around like being sober minded and Jesus' mm-hmm. wake up calls and Jesus yeah. inviting us to see and open the eyes of my heart and even Jesus' invitation to abundant life or what some translations would call wholehearted living. Mm-hmm. It's 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 it means you have a heart that works, you have a heart that feels. You yeah. feel hurt, you feel yeah. you also feel joy. You you know, yeah. you feel a afraid, but you also feel courageous, you know? Yeah. And so it's, the, it's that wholehearted life that, that, uh, waking up to life that you're describing is such a beautiful, beautiful treasure mm-hmm. in the cave. Yeah. Last question. What, what would you guys say to someone whose head trash is holding them back from pursuing what they want? Uh, and, and particularly like from becoming a certified Enneagram coach, you know, what, if, if they have some limiting belief that is keeping them held back from that, what, what's a line or two, a word or two that, that you would offer? Uh, Lynette, let's start with you. I think that it is critical that you name that lie or that belief that is holding you back because until you name it, you can't deal with it. So Mm -hmm. Uncovering the lie so you can expose the truth on top of that. And that's what I would say for that. If God is telling you to do it, then obey him. He's faithful. Mm -hmm. He is so faithful to provide what you need and transform you in the process. But but name the lie so that you can lay truth over it. Yeah. Oh, such a helpful word. Yeah. Uh, Greg, what about you? Well, I'm going to speak to my type. Uh, uh, don't let fear hold you back. Um, there's no time like now to get certified and to launch. For me, if I would have delayed the launching, I just had to simply commit to launching. And, and then mm. I had to figure things out along the way. Mm. And I, I do not, I, every time I go into a coaching session or a typing session, for an upcoming opportunity, I wrestle with, I do not know enough, Hmm. Um, but I do the hard work to to get closer to knowing enough, but I'm never going to be able to know enough. That's just how I'm wired, but that cannot be the reason why I don't do something. Hmm. The fact is that all of our experiences, we have something to offer other people. We can all speak out of some part of our life, some part of our journey, some part of our training. And yes, we're not going to know as much as somebody else, but that's always going to be the case. Yes. That's so helpful, Greg. Thank you. Stevie? Yeah, I would say take a step at a time. Um, We interviewed on the the podcast my husband and I do for our nonprofit. We interviewed this um, behavioral specialist and performance coach. And granted, it was in the realm of athletics, but I, th- I think it can also go with this. He said that we have to focus, we have to, we have to kind of take expectations off the table and just focus on the task at hand. Um, so if we have an expectation of having this giant flourishing um, business, we can't keep our focus on that. We have to keep our focus on the task at hand and one task at hand. And then the next task at hand and then the next next task at hand will eventually lead to that. But we have to be able to just focus on the task at hand. Um, and for me, that was very helpful. And hmm. so I'd say focus on just one step at a, hand, uh, at a time, the task at hand. And like I said, speak so unapologetically kind to yourself. Be so yeah. graceful to yourself because as yeah. that comes up, the worst thing you can do is shame yourself for it. Cause that's just going to paralyze you more. So you have yes. to be like, Oh, 
okay, I see you, imposter syndrome. There you are. Oh, okay. So yeah. you're just trying to protect me. You're trying to protect me right now. I got yeah. this. It's okay. You can take a seat. I'm going to go ahead and take control now. <laughs> um, yes. You just got to kind of like remind your imposter syndrome who's actually boss. Like, okay, thank you. Thank you so much for trying to protect me. I'm actually the boss. So you can go ahead and take a break. That sounded (laughs) like your mom voice, Stevie. (laughs) Yeah. Well, you know, it comes out. (laughs) Excuse me. What do you want to talk to me like that? Let's have a conversation. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. You can take a seat now. You're in timeout. (laughs) You're in timeout. (laughs) Um, And, and you can't wait for that imposter syndrome. We've talked about this before. You can't wait for that imposter syndrome to go away. You have to you have to acknowledge it, and then you have to give it a time out um, yeah. and let it let it ebb, ebb and flow. But get in the yeah. arena. Get in the arena. If it takes one step at a time to do it, do it. That's so helpful. And um, gosh, you know, I just want to grab onto everything you guys are saying, and I want to talk for two more hours, and we just don't have time. <laughs> But, you know, Greg, uh, I think to close, I want to something you said, is you said, I can't let this be the reason I don't do this. Mm. And what I want to offer to anyone who's you know on the fence is whatever that thing is, the imposter syndrome, whatever it's saying about you to you about what how others are going to perceive you or whatever. Not only can you not let it be the reason you don't it it very well might be the reason that you need to. Mm. Many times God calls us into taking risks. Uh, He puts dreams in our hearts and calls us to pursue those to uh, mature these parts of us, to heal these parts of us. And, um, you know, I love, I love all the language we've used today about treating these parts of us with kindness. I just want to say the imposter is begging for your kind and compassionate leadership. It, it actually wants you to lead and drive. It wants you to step in and say, hey, I'm, I'm this many years old and I've got, I, you know, like I, Christ has me and, I, and I'm gonna, we're going to do this and we're going to pursue this and it's okay. Mm-hmm. Like that part of you is actually dying and begging for that kind of compassionate leadership um, because typically it's exhausted at, at its efforts of trying to protect you mm-hmm. and run your life. It doesn't, actually wa- it doesn't actually want to mm-hmm. play that role for you, mm-hmm. uh, but it thinks it has to. So I I just want to say, Lynette, Stevie, Greg, thank you so much for joining us today. I I know this is going to serve our listeners uh, so well, and especially anyone who's considering becoming a coach. And it has served me so well. And so thank you so much for being here today. It's a pleasure. And thanks for having us. The opportunity. And to those of you who are listening, you know, thank you for tuning in. If you're interested in becoming an Enneagram coach and and leading others on the journey of moving from the imposter self to becoming their true self and their best self using the tool of the Enneagram, our certification course will be opening for enrollment on June 21st and will close on June 28th at midnight. And, you know, like all coaches who have gone before you, as you've heard today, you'll have to walk through your own head trash and imposter syndrome to become a coach, but there is treasure in the cave that you fear. Thank you for tuning into this episode and I'll see you next week. And remember the Enneagram reveals your need for Jesus, not your need to work harder. It's only the gospel that transforms us. Thank you all for joining us.